A new generation is transforming animal rights activism. You still need passion, but activists are trading in their picket signs for PhDs in science, and they're saving millions of animals' lives. Meet members of the PETA Science Consortium International, next on The PETA Podcast. Welcome to The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this inside look at animal rights. Brought to you by PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. On today's episode, the PETA Science Consortium International celebrates its 10th year saving animals all over the globe. The consortium is a group of scientists from all over PETA's different global entities working together to deal specifically with governments and private industry in order to change toxicology laws and regulations. Those laws require tests intended to show a product is safe for humans. But too often, they're cruel and deadly for the animals. And it's all for naught, as testing on animals is mostly irrelevant when it comes to humans. How did we get to this illogical point in science? Inertia, old methods, a reluctance to accept modern technologies, those are all the reasons. So it's up to the consortium to change minds, change regulations, and save animals. I talk with PETA science advisor Jeff Brown, a veteran of the consortium, also to Gina Hilton, a PETA toxicologist, and Bridget Rogers, a PETA scientist who works on outreach and education. Here's our conversation on the PETA podcast. Thank you all once again for being with us. And we have not just a consortium, we have a quorum here on the PETA podcast. We have, we have out of four people, we have three scientists and I want to introduce you all. So Gina, you're a toxicologist. I am. It sounds scarier than what it is. <laughs> okay. So Gina Hilton, and how long have you been with the PETA Science Consortium? Yes, so I am a toxicologist and an advisor to the PETA Science Consortium International, and I've been with the team actually just over five years now, so half a decade. Uh, now we go to Bridget. Bridget, you're a scientist uh, with the consortium. Yes. Hi. It's nice to be here. Um, my background is in environmental public health. And I actually met Gina at a career fair a few years ago, which was a very happy meeting um, because I didn't know I was going to be able to tie my, my personal beliefs in animal rights and veganism with my scientific career until I discovered that the science consortium existed. And so it's been really great to work here. And I'm one of the newer additions to the team. I've been here about two years now. So Bridget Rogers, scientist, we've had uh... Gina Hilton, toxicologist, and the third scientist in our panel today is an old hand to the PETA podcast. We've had him on numerous times. Jeff Brown, who is technically science advisor. Is that your, your new title, Jeff? Yeah. I mean, everybody who's here, we're all advisors to the science consortium. I've been here since we started the science consortium 10 years ago, but I go back a little further than that. This is my 13th year doing science work for PETA. In my background is in public health and epidemiology, but if uh, PETA does anything with drugs or medical devices, it probably comes through me. Great. All right. So now we have we have Gina Hilton, toxicologist, Bridget Rogers, scientist, Jeff Brown. And so let's get into this thing here about the science consortium that you talked about. The PETA Science Consortium International, it sounds like you should have uh, your own brand. It's, 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 it's a separate entity from PETA kind of, right? Yeah, very much so. Um, and it's big, it's, it's big as what it is. Um, we had really humble beginnings. We were just a handful of people 10 years ago, but you know, today we are 25 scientists and we're all around the world and we need those 25 people because we work on a really big task. And that task is that we find every opportunity uh, to get governments and companies using modern animal-free tests. And we say that's really important. That's sort of separated from, from what PETA entities do because we need representation in all these government agencies around the world. Because if you change one rule that says an animal test has to be used, and then it can say a non-animal test can be used, that saves 
hundreds, thousands, you know, millions of animals' lives over time. It's a big task. We need a lot of people to do it. And so by bringing together this international consortium, it it kind of gives weight to what PETA does, to the science that PETA does. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, we formed this consortium because PETA is made up of these entities around the world, PETA US, PETA UK, PETA Germany. We were doing great scientific work in all those regions, but we recognized that we were working on international projects. This is an international problem, animal testing, when it comes to requirements that government agencies have. So we needed an international body that would allow us to have the right kind of uh, presence. Some, Some international government agencies won't even let you in the door unless you can prove that you're part of a a big international force that has people working in different regions. Um, So that's exactly what we had to do. And we're 10 years in now, and it's been a pretty impressive 10 years. Now, you you say this phrase, uh, animal tests that are required by government agencies, and you said it uh, a couple of times already in this short period, but that is a very specific kind of, of testing. It's required, that's the key word, versus the kind of idle research that maybe a scientist who's looking for grants from NIH might do. Uh, tell me more about this; these required tests by government agencies. Yeah, I can talk more about this. So there are d- two, in my mind, two distinct types of animal testing when you think of animal testing. The first is sort of the generic one that refers to testing that's done at universities. It's at the discretion of the researchers. And there's another section of PETA that works on that. But the science consortium, we specifically work in the area of government required testing. And this is testing that is uh, mandated by law through government agencies such as in the United States, uh, the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, and the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, on a variety of products um, that are before they're sold. And this can include things like pesticides, industrial chemicals, both over-the-counter and prescription drugs, um, even household cleaners. All these things have to be tested. And so the work we do is trying to get, instead of using animals for those tests, trying to get these government agencies to use non-animal test methods. Yeah. And that was, again, Bridget Rogers, who is part of this outreach and education wing of the consortium. But once again, explain this idea when you say toxicology tests versus the kind of tests, as I was saying, that the, say a, a researcher with some kind of wild notion and then he applies for a grant, uh, how they're different. Those are different kinds of things because you're required to test on these animals People think, oh, well, that's okay if they're required to test. That means that it's good for the public. But what do you tell people when they say, oh, well, then that's the important kind of testing where we we know we have to do these toxicology tests to prevent people from being harmed? Well, certainly the testing is important because we need to use something to make sure that these products are safe for human health and they're safe for the environment. However, what we do know is that Uh, we can say this very confidently, that testing on animals is flawed because animals aren't humans, and it's really that simple. Um, So when we're thinking about this testing, we really need to be thinking about, is it relevant to humans? And that's a lot of what our work is, is in doing right now, is trying to make sure that the methods are relevant to humans. And so I guess, Bridget, when you talk to to the different companies and different governments. And and when you educate people, I guess Gina Hilton's work is very important because Gina, that's what you do as a toxicologist, right? Absolutely. The name of the game for sure is providing safety. So in any time there's a product that's coming into the market or any time there's a potential exposure in the environment, that is the, the golden rule is to make sure that um, the ecosystems are safe, to make sure humans are safe. And we are working to make sure that the methods that are being used in toxicity testing are as safe as possible. And right, right now, the tests that are conducted on animals for safety assessment, they are simply not relevant. And I think a really great example of this we can see with um, carcinogenicity testing. And I know that this is something that we've talked about before on the podcast in, in the war on cancer episode, but specifically 
Governments require toxicity testing to try to address concerns about the ability of a substance to cause cancer. That type of test is called a carcinogenicity test, and it's conducted on rats and mice for their entire lives. So this is years worth of testing on an animal, the animals are suffering, and the tumors that develop in these animals, they are simply not relevant to humans. So you're wasting time, you're wasting money, and you're potentially putting lives at risk yeah. because you're not providing safety. And and so, Jeff, you heard what Gina said, and all that seems to be quite convincing evidence. But when you go to these governments as part of the consortium, why is it such an uphill battle to deal with uh, people when you say, look, this isn't relevant, this is wasteful? Why is it such a fight? Laws weren't built to be changed easily, right? Rules get put in place and the, it's difficult to change them. This this is one of the reasons why the work that we do, uh, it requires a lot of patience. I'm going to say that very diplomatically. When animal tests are used, when there's no requirement for them, it's very easy for a researcher to be convinced to stop doing that test because they can just stop doing it. But if a company is making um, a chemical that's going to be released into the environment, they can't just say, we don't want to do this animal test. A government agency tells them you, you must do it. So when you approach a government agency, you come armed with good information on how much better non-animal tests are at this task. And then ideally, you work with scientists and people within the government agency and people within companies because it's a big group effort. It's a collective effort where everyone has to fulfill a role in this multi-step process that takes years in order to change that rule. I, I imagine that 10 years prior, uh, before there was a consortium, it must have felt like Sisyphus a bit, you know, <laughs> uh, rolling a, a boulder. Uh, I mean, because it seems that uh, when you deal with governments, you also deal with a certain amount of inertia. Uh, you were you were right to say that it, you know, you know, laws weren't meant to, you know, be changed. People are resistant to change. Let's turn to the toxicologists again. Uh, Gina, what's the killer thing that you're looking for that might might be the fact that will turn things around. Our current situation is that there is a generation, a previous generation that has a false sense of security in animal testing. And that is simply what it is. I think there is fear in moving forward into the unknown of modern technologies but when it comes to things of using new approaches and new methods to fulfill safety assessment, risk assessors and, and regulatory um, authorities might be a little bit scared. Again, very simply, we have the technologies, we have the tissue engineering, we have computer models, we have quantum computers and artificial intelligence, and we have all of these tools in the toolbox. We have the tools. It's just a matter of implementing them for regulatory decisions to improve protection. That is really trying to overcome those, again, the false sense of security that I think is really where we are right now. It's it's more of a problem of sociology and not science. No. <laughs> it's, it's, it's incredible when you think that if they move to those non-animal testing models, you mentioned waste earlier, Gina, but, but Jeff, what kind of waste is, what, how many animals could be spared if we went to non-animal models versus the continuing on in the way we are now? And these numbers absolutely are in the millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions. It just depends on how far into the future you're looking. You know, if one animal testing requirement is ended today, then every year there's X number of animals saved for the rest of time. You know, we make, we make a switch once and those are enormous numbers. But I think also everyone is familiar with this, this discussion in real terms. It, it, we've all heard about medicines that are, they make it to the market, hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people take these drugs, and then some serious health effect is found. You know, people get sick, people die, um, and then those drugs are taken back off the market. So I think we all see that the system that relies on animal testing that's been used in the past, like Gina said, 
we have a false sense of security that that approach works well. It, it still lets dangerous chemicals out into the environment, still lets dangerous drugs into the market. The idea now is that we're not just saving uh, hundreds of thousands, you know, millions of animals. We're also saving people. And that recognition, I think, is something that I often consider a bit of an open secret in our field. Um, this isn't what we're saying. It's not just the science consortium saying it. It's not just animal advocates saying it. Uh, this is a, a, a pretty well-established scientific fact at this point. Uh, how do you mean that it saves people's lives? This all comes back to this question of what, why do we have toxicology? Why, why are these tests required in the first place? And it's because if we let companies sell products, that's fine. Companies can sell these products, but we want to make sure that they're safe for us to, to use, whether it's a kitchen cleaner or a pill we take every day, a fertilizer that we use in our gardens. We want to make sure that we're not using it and thinking that there's no potential risk for us. So that's what all of these tests are designed to do. They're designed to say, we want to make sure that you can use a product, whatever this product might be. But we want to make sure that when you're using it, you don't have to think so much about these safety rules. And if, if those rules get broken a little bit, or if we make some bad assumptions, like we use the test on rats, sometimes rats don't get cancer. When people do get cancer, you expose them to the same chemical, they have different reactions. We have to save animals' lives by focusing on science that does a better job at saving human lives. Gina, when you go to do your outreach and your education, what do you find it most astounds you when... Or what are people most astounded by when you tell them the facts and you tell them what what really happens in the labs, uh, how effective new tests are versus how ineffective the old tests are? That is such a good question. I recently had somebody ask me if I would take a pharmaceutical that had not been that had not gone through carcinogenicity testing. My answer was yes. I didn't even have to think about it. Because I think that, again, getting back to that false sense of security, I think that people just have no idea how irrelevant these tests on animals are. They, they produce information, but the information is not relevant to humans. And so that is where I think that there's somewhat of a knowledge gap, is that the public is trusting that products are safe, when in reality, we see this in pharmaceuticals that are going into clinical trials where they pass the preclinical trials of testing of the, of the animal test. And then as soon as they go to trial on the humans, they fail. And it's at an astounding rate. I know that Jeff can speak to this um, probably more thoroughly, but I just think that that's a great example of, I personally absolutely would be willing to take any sort of a uh, pharmaceutical or vaccine that had not gone through animal testing, just because I think that that I'm I'm not a dog and a dog is not me. We are biologically completely different, and so that's where I think there's a little bit of an information gap. Yeah, and and so Jeff, uh, to take up Gina's challenge, can you speak to that more thoroughly or or not? Or did she do? Yeah, of course. I, I, we can talk about this all day, and we. I've, I've been doing this work for, for let's say close to 20 years and the numbers haven't changed much. You know, this, this figure is uh, every company that gets involved in drug development, they know that 95% of the, the drugs that they develop and they spend years, decades, millions of dollars uh, proving that they, that they work well in non-human animals, that they're safe in non-human animals. 95% of those drugs are never going to make it to market. Because as soon as they get to human clinical trials, they fail. They're not effective or they're risky. Again, this is this is that sort of open secret. It, the industry has known this. The governments have known this. But that doesn't mean that the laws that require those tests go away. So 10 years of, of the long view looking back on facing a problem like this when we started the science consortium with very you know, limited means, it's, it's thrilling to see how many people in governments and in these companies that make these products, the researchers who we meet, most people agree with us. We find we've we've had 10 years of really good collaborations. Uh, it, it's been a successful 10 years because 
everyone is looking for a solution to this problem. Everyone is trying to find out how do we make these changes? And the science consortium is in this wonderful position. We're not a company. We're not a government. We can kind of do what we want. And we put the animals first and it solves problems along the way. Yeah. And so Bridget, your job is to do the outreach, to get to people and, and to, to, it doesn't say what, Jeff and Gina are saying, sounds like you don't really have to change their minds a whole lot, but, <laughs> but you know, it's tougher than that, right? Well, certainly. And um, I think it's important to say we're not often doing outreach with the public as much as we are doing it with the people who work for these companies, the people who work at the government agencies. And so a big part of our, of our work is education, um, but because we know these non-animal methods are available, but then the issue is kind of bridging the gap between the methods that are out there and actually having them being utilized by the agencies to fulfill the requirements. So um, to overcome this challenge, the Science Consortium, we organize a lot of training sessions to help scientists become more proficient in the methods. Um, we also develop and make uh, available free educational materials like fact sheets. Our website has a lot of helpful content. We're actually co-hosting an ongoing webinar series with the EPA right now that's specifically focused on non-animal methods for pesticides and chemical regulation. And all the webinars that we have, they're all available for free. They're on YouTube. You know, we encourage everyone to watch them and rewatch them to learn more about the options that are out there. So, so Bridget, when you're doing this and they're saying, this is PETA, they aren't the people on the corner with this protest sign. These are scientists. They're, they're telling us how to do our job. It, it must freak out a certain generation of people who've always seen PETA as, oh, you know, that's PETA. Uh, now they're kind of almost collaborators. Yeah. I mean, I see this even in my personal life, telling people that I am a scientist, you know, with the PETA Science Consortium, you get certain reactions from the older generation. But um, I think it's important to look towards the future and to look at what younger people are doing now, because I know so many people who are students, um, we've seen them at conferences, we've interacted with them. They know that they are non-animal options that are out there that are better because they not only spare animals, so it's better from the ethical side, but it's also better for, you know, human outcomes, like we talked about, more human relevant methods. So because of that, I think I'm not as concerned with the old guard, which is not going to be there forever. You know, we're looking at the future and, you know, the next 10 years of our work and where we're going to be able to go. And I'm really just so optimistic. Yeah. Well, the future, you're going to save more or animal lives that that's going to make a difference and that's going to open up people's eyes. Uh, I'm going to ask all of you this question and let's begin with you, Bridget on this. Uh, the, the idea when you out, are out there doing your outreach, is there a, a lifting of the, you know, the eyelid scales moment that you have when you tell people about the reality of what could be that astounds you when you think, Oh God, this is such a simple thing or astounds them when you tell them, this is could be the reality all the time in terms of toxicology and animal testing and regulations. Is there that kind of moment or a, a fact that you that you recall when you share it? People are just dumbfounded. I have so many good facts. I love to share them. Um, the one I like to share, and then I'll get back to answering your full question, is that um, aspirin is actually toxic to rats and mice and dogs and cats. It actually came out in the 1890s before animal testing was a thing. But if it had been testing at animals, people would have said, oh, this is a poison instead of, oh, this is actually a great you know, medicine that can help us with pain. So I love telling people that because I think they don't realize that at all. In general, I think one example here of a test that is more relevant in humans is this test that's done in rabbits to determine if accidental exposure to our eyes can cause swelling or irritation or even blindness. And um, it's a test that's been done for, for years. And the problem is that our eyes are fundamentally different. The way that chemicals react to rabbit eyes versus human eyes are, is not the same. Rabbits produce fewer tears and they actually have a third eyelid. But there's this great in vitro test, which is a, a test that involves lab-grown human eye cells, and it's widely available. This is one of the tests that we've been working on, that we've been promoting. And it's it's so much better because, uh, especially for, from the perspective of somebody who's working in a lab where they might have an accidental uh, eye splash from a chemical, let's say, um, you know, you would want to be, if you want to feel safe about th that risk of exposure, you're probably going to want the test to have been done on relevant, something relevant to you, the, the human and eye cells versus something done in a completely different species. It's not relevant at all. 
So when you expose this and you tell them this, then you become their new best friends and they, and they want to learn this technique and they want to change or is it, uh, that's just the beginning of the change that needs to occur, right? It is just the beginning. And I think this speaks to our work at conferences also. Uh, Gina and I attended a conference back in June and part of our outreach is also doing uh, travel awards and grants to get people, young uh, young career, uh, early career scientists or students to go to conferences to learn about the non-animal methods. And it's really just talking to them. It is so exciting to hear about their standpoint of it and, and how much they really want to be working in this area. And it's really great that we get to to sponsor those people and to talk to them more and just get out there and, and spread the word. Gina, how about you? What what, what kind of uh, lifting of the scales kind of moment do, that, that make you realize that you're doing some important work here? Yes, I recently had this experience where I was giving a lecture at two separate universities focused on how to use non-animal testing methods specifically for regulatory safety tests, I have a slide that shows the list of tests, but then also the number of animals that are currently used in that test. And for example, for to bring a pesticide to, to market. So one, one product in the United States, so just in the United States, just one pesticide product, it takes 10 to 15,000 animals that are killed for this one registration. And after both of my lectures separately, the professors emailed me saying they had no idea. They were completely blown away and really taken aback that it was that large of lives that are being killed. And they just had no idea the extent of the, of the, um, of the requirements. And to me, I think that's a great starting point to share that actually, you know, it's not just professors learning this, it's, it's sharing this with the public as well, because I think a lot of times people just have no idea the extent of, of how many animals are being killed. And really this this presents, I wanted to get back to, to a quick point from Jeff earlier. I think we have such an incredible opportunity with a shared understanding of, of the limitations that come from traditional toxicity testing on animals. You know, regulators know the limitations. Industry knows the limitations. I think even now more and more so academics are learning these limitations. And so this is where we have the opportunity to coalesce around let's do it better we can improve health protection let's do it better using modern technologies not testing on animals yeah you know jeff this sort of brings it back to the problem that scientists are just doing science blindly in some ways they're just doing things the way it's always been done to get the same results because that's all they need to do. They need to get a passing grade for a, a, you know, some kind of substance. And, you know, well, we've always done it this way. We'll just keep doing it till we get the right answer. I mean, but it just seems like a bad way to do science. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's, it's another one of those problems. This is sort of built into how science works. Science is kind of meant to be a little slow and creaky. And if you're not pushing, it's not going to move, but you know, I say all the time, when I first started uh, working for the science consortium, um, I would say that I was a bit intimidated going into an office with a bunch of government scientists. I thought, oh man, what are they going to think about us? I've been around long enough now. I know we're all scientists. We, we, we're very confident in what we do. I know that it's only going to take one meeting, one discussion, and we're all going to understand that we, we have the right kind of science, the right kind of, uh, outlook in the world. I think sometimes for me, what I find more surprising almost is that if I'm talking to someone, if I'm in an airport and someone sees that I've got like a shirt on, that's got a, a science consortium logo and they say, you have scientists. Like I didn't know there were animal rights scientists. I didn't know that was an issue. That's the fascinating part of this to me. None of us, I think Bridget, Gina, or myself, none of us knew that something like the science consortium existed. 
And when we found out that it did, we rushed towards it. And so, I mean, we're hiring, you know, so we're always looking for more scientists to join us. I think the more that we get the message out, the more people get to have that epiphany of their own. And not everybody has to be a scientist to help. I mean, every bit of work that we've been talking about today, it's all put in motion by donations from people who support $1, $5, it all adds up. And we are entering this period where we've got a stop animal testing challenge. And until the end of October, every donation up to $500,000 gets matched. Those are the kind of contributions that people make where they think, well, I'm not a scientist. Well, you you can still help us out with this work, you know? Um, and every time I get to talk to someone and say that, like your part in this is so critical because we wouldn't be in those rooms with the government agencies if you weren't right behind us, giving us the support that we need to do that work. You're talking about science on the one hand, but then it's also a political fight. Is some of this money the reason why you're trying to, you have a 500,000 goal in this October stop animal testing drive. Uh, is, is it because some of the effort is kind of political for people who want to contribute in this October stop animal testing fundraiser? Where does the money go? Is it how much to politics? How much to science? I'd say it's, it's as much as we can give to the science. Science ain't cheap. You know, this, it, when we talk about science, we're not just talking about a couple of, you know, test tubes in a laboratory. We're talking about, you know, 10 or 20 companies, uh, three or four government agencies. You have to have meetings and workshops and you, you have to agree on the steps that you're going to take for these processes and projects. And it's a real effort, this work. A lot of the times we end up when we put together our expectations of what do people in, in the world, you know, what do government agencies think they that these projects are going to cost? They'll often come to us and say, this project will cost $10 million. One of the ways that we excel is that we crunch the numbers, do the work, we find the essential heart of the problem, and then we come back with the budget that says we can do this for $100,000, right? So that's something that in industry and in government agencies, that's not often a big uh, goal of theirs. We we really focus and, and, and pull this work in, and that's the work that's being supported. It's, it's political, yes, but every piece of work that we do is education. There's there's always a learning experience for all the people we work with. So I, get, I think every piece of science in that regard is a little bit political. <laughs> okay. Well, I just know that recently we talked about the push in the EU to change uh, toxicology tests and they had to raise or they had to collect 1.5 million signatures and PDUK and others are in the process of vetting those signatures and trying to get uh, the laws change there. I'm sure you're following that being you're, you're in that neck of the woods. How, how far away are we from success there, Jeff? We prefer optimism and realism. I think those two overlap pretty well. If, if we say that we could get everybody to agree on these steps, we could knock out these required animal tests in 20 years, 30 years. If we're more realistic, we know it's going to take a little bit longer than that. But that also means that if we work really hard, some victories happen sooner than later. And I think when you see um, efforts to uh, see what kind of public support do these initiatives have, you know, how popular is it when we go to government agencies and say, we should make it a priority to end requirements to use animals in tests. We should make it easy to use modern science instead of old science that uses animals. It's much more popular now than it was in the past. And I think a big part of that is because of the work that groups like the Science Consortium and the PETA entities keep doing. Those, It's hand in glove. You can't have one without the other. Yeah. Um, they, they, they really are two parts of the same puzzle. I'm really happy to have uh, three members of the Science Consortium on the PETA podcast. And in one last go round, let me go to each of you and... Uh, and just tell me what's the most gratifying thing about the work and what's the challenge ahead uh, from your perspective. And let's begin with Bridget, Bridget, the outreach person. What's the, what's the big challenge ahead? 
The challenge ahead is just to continue to do the work that we're doing right now to try to to get these non-animal methods that exist to be taken up and used more often by the companies, by the government agencies. And that's the work we're doing every day. You know, it's going to continue. And as we expand, you know, as we get more people um, on our team, it's just going to get easier and easier to us to take on more of a workload and do more in this area. And I also want to say, I feel like we're in this we're really in this golden age of non-animal method development right now. There are so many things coming out all the time. Um, this organ on chip technology uh, where you can basically make a, a little mini human organ system and test via that instead of testing on animals. Um, like what Gina mentioned earlier with computer technology and machine learning, there are just so many things coming out constantly that I think it's just going to get easier and better um, in terms of the testing available and easier to use these methods to stop testing in animals. Yeah. I mean, you figure with all the apps and the AI technology and all that, there's got to be a way that you can test something that's not living and get to the answer you want. But let's turn to the toxicologist. Gina, is that going to fly with the, your community, your toxicology community? And what's the challenge for you, Ed? Yes, I would say the tide is certainly changing. Um, and I think my my favorite part, Golden Age, Bridget, that was such a great way of putting it. Um, I, I love to see that there are all of these new technologies and that the science consortium is really stepping up to the plate to be a steward of these technologies and these new methods, um, bringing that to regulators, bringing, bringing these trainings and learnings to regulators, to the industry, to graduate students, all of these opportunities to learn we're making that publicly available and we're connecting people. And I think that that's such an exciting piece of the journey to witness and to be a part of. And also at the end of the day, to know that we, we're we working as hard as we can to save lives. And I personally love any opportunity that we have to be able to engage with our members. Um, because as Jeff was saying, really our members are are critical to the, the work that we can carry out. I just hope that we continue to keep this momentum, keep the push going forward. And again, I think that the tools are there. I think that there are doors are being opened more and more every single day in the regulatory community. We just got to keep moving forward and, and keep pushing. Yeah. Well, it, it's a long fight. And Jeff, who's been with the consortium longest, you know how long a fight it is. You've mentioned it in the conversation. What is the challenge next for, for the consortium in the, in the next 10 years or 20 years? Pete is 40 years old. I can't imagine anyone 40 years ago could have thought that there'd be a consortium in 2022, 2023. I started paying my PETA dues in 1992 or 93, I think. And I certainly didn't expect that this is where, where it would lead. And I say pretty confidently, what is our biggest challenge? We are only so many people. We're spinning so many plates. There is so much work. We're always hiring. You know, come to us, work with us. We know pretty firmly now our niche. We know our role. We're very confident in, in the work that we do. Um, and I would even say that the years that I've been here, it, it's amazing to me on a daily basis to see um, when you feel like something is is a you know endlessly pushing a boulder up a slope. Well, the longer your view, the more distance you can see that you've covered. And I mean, just this morning, I was talking to a startup company in India um, and it, it, it's, it's run by these two fascinating young people who are in their early twenties. They've started a company and instead of just saying that they've developed some new human relevant method, they say, we did this because we want to move away from animal testing. We want to help the field to move away. So that is now such a taken for granted part of, of how young scientists are, are willing to work that I think that means for us, the, uh, you know, the future is wide open. Um, we, we don't have to work quite so hard to find people who really want to work with this message of saying we need to take animals and animal suffering out of the progress of science. That's a that's a something that we can take for granted now. So I the the future is bright. I cannot wait to see what we do in another 10 years. 
Yeah. And in after the first 10 years, as Gina said, this consortium and the PETA consortium has become a kind of steward for ongoing best practices, which must be gratifying to you and, and the consortium. Absolutely. Well, uh, thank you again, all, all of you for being part of the PETA podcast. Thank you to Bridget Rogers outreach. Is there a title that I should, I don't want to demote you <laughs> inadvertently, but you're like the outreach educator, superwoman out there. I do both outreach and the science side, you know, because in this consortium, we all have our, our hands in lots of different things and we're all doing, wearing lots of hats at different times. So I do a lot of things. I think uh scientist just about covers it. You could say anything though. Well, Bridget Rogers, scientist, Gina Hilton, toxicologist, and Jeff Brown, overall science guru at the PETA Science Consortium. Thank you all for being part of the PETA podcast. Thanks, Emil. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having us. Three members of PETA's Science Consortium International, Jeff Brown, Gina Hilton, Bridget Rogers, PETA scientists all... You know, this is a unique group, the Science Consortium International. They are a separate entity and they are dedicated to changing the regulatory testing environment in order to save animals. For more, check out the link to the consortium, their website in our show notes. And that's our show for today. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to send a link of this show to your friends. Tell them you like the PETA podcast. Contact us at PETA.org. You can find me on Twitter at Emil Amok. That's E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K. Or see my vlog at AMOK.com. Or see my work at ALDEF, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. That's ALDEF, A-A-L-D-E-F dot org slash blog. Once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on your favorite podcast app or on Apple Podcasts where you can subscribe to as well as rate and review the show. It helps get the word out about the issues you care about. Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. And join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo.